What are animals willing to do to survive? This is the part of a puma that got caught in a trap. The animal had to simply chew it off to save itself. But that's not the strangest or scariest case yet. All kangaroos are known to be willing to sacrifice their own children at the moment of greatest danger. Kangaroos simply get rid of their offspring and sometimes right on the move, trying to escape a predator. And that's, oh my god, that's really awful. How can any mother ever decide that it's better to sacrifice her child? Blows my mind. Just imagine some bacteria are capable of self-sacrifice within a colony. They die to protect the others from the effects of antibiotics. So tiny organisms understand the importance of the lives of others and are willing to sacrifice themselves for their loved ones. But kangaroos aren't. Kangaroos have no regrets about such things at all. Well, today little is known about emotions after such events. But kangaroo expert Graham Colson of the University of Melbourne claims that they only get rid of a baby when there are no other options left. The mother is interested in surviving to give birth again, and if she doesn't sacrifice the baby, there's a risk of dying with it. So, on one side of the scale is the death of one kangaroo cub. On the other side is the death of the female, that kangaroo cub, and all of those that have yet to be born. A cruel choice, but no amount of maternal love can overpower the desire to survive. The kangaroo is likely to be sad for a while after leaving the predator behind the way only animals that have lost children can be sad. Many social species grieve when their babies die. A case is known when an orca swam for at least six hours with the body of its dead newborn refusing to take food. This behavior is found not only in cetaceans, but also in elephants, giraffes, chimpanzees, and other primates. Perhaps turtles, bison, and birds can also grieve. <laughs> And grief works both ways. A baby that's lost its mother will grieve in the same way for a while. Isn't that enough for you? It seems that some animals are capable of feeling guilt for their actions, and I'm not talking about dogs, which usually have everything written on their faces. What did you do to this tissue? Tell me. What did you do? Even big cats have some kind of conscious sometimes lionesses adopt the babies of their victims for a while and even protect them from other predators. Some scientists suggest that this is simply a maternal instinct malfunction, while others call this behavior playing with food. But what about the lioness who, after killing a pregnant antelope, became so upset that she tried to revive the unborn baby? Is this playing with food or playing operation? However, if there were a competition in empathy among animals, elephants would take first place due to their high intelligence. They can empathize and are even willing to help other creatures. For example, elephants try not to harm or kill a human being even when it's very difficult to do so. You know the size difference. One careless step, and while most animals lose interest in the body of a dead container, after a while, elephants pay homage even to the bones. In fact, elephants even have certain rituals in case one of the herd dies. When you realize all this, elephants almost seem human, but all animals are programmed to survive. The more individuals that can continue the species, the better for the population you know. I had a change of heart about elephants when I came across this video. The little elephant was orphaned after losing its herd, so it tried to join another because of their empathy and intelligence. Elephants can adopt others' lost cubs, but not in this case. The video was filmed during a severe drought that put every animal in danger of death. A herd of elephants simply couldn't begin to take care of someone else's baby either. Guess what became of it? Yup. And that's exactly how nature works. If this herd adopts a baby elephant during a rough patch, they'll get less food and this will lead to the death of the adults. A mother kangaroo, by sacrificing one baby, can give life to dozens more by continuing her life. I don't think she wanted to part with her cub, but the fear of death triggered processes in her body that she couldn't resist. The instinct of self-preservation is considered basic in all living organisms. It's triggered as a reaction to pain or fear and causes strange, sometimes horrible things to happen. A female kangaroo simply can't handle it, but humans can by artificially inducing fear. Scientists have learned to control the animal population at times a lot better than scientists scared raccoons, so they couldn't breed anyway. <laughs> Such an experiment did take place. The lack of natural predators on the small islands in the Strait of Georgia made raccoon life a paradise. Humans exterminated bears and cougars centuries ago, which meant that raccoons could feed at any time and in any quantity. Eventually, they bred in incredible numbers and began to behave just brazenly while also exterminating crabs of the species cancer productive. Then these scientists decided to put recordings with the voices of various animals a bear cougar, a sea lion, and an ordinary domestic dog. And it was 
the barking that caused the raccoons to be truly terrified. They ran away every time they heard it. And as a result, the crab population recovered and people were able to control the number of raccoons. As the saying goes, everybody wins. Well, except maybe the raccoons themselves. And then I thought animals don't like the feeling of fear. They want to get rid of it as soon as possible. So why do people like to rattle nerves with things like horror movies? Do we like being afraid? Well, yes and no, people like to experience fear, but only in safe conditions and in moderation. Giving yourself a chance to be properly scared, knowing that there's no real danger is very satisfying. It's all about hormones. Completely different emotions are accompanied by the release of the same hormones, and our reaction to what's happening depends on our brain's perception. Does it feel good or is it scary at the moment of real danger? There's a strong release of adrenaline, but along with it, serotonin and endorphins are released and the mood of the person rises dramatically. And when there's no need to run from danger, you can just enjoy the side effect to understand exactly how all this works. Scientists had to spend a lot of time and effort, but they conducted the most research in the 20th century. In late 1919, John Watson began to study fear as an innate body response, and he quickly found out it's quite realistic to teach someone to be afraid of something if you know exactly how to act. But the point is not to compel someone's unexpected phobias and then laugh wickedly while watching the person be afraid of socks. <laughs> <laughs> Fear control can affect the survival of entire species during a population on the Borneo island is decreasing because of human activity and because of snakes. There are more than 160 species of them in here, most of them venomous, and they often attack orangutans faster than those who understand what to be afraid of. That's why people have created special schools, or orangutans, where they teach them how to survive. This is one of the strangest things I've ever uttered the program. Also includes proper handling of snakes. The teachers do everything they can to get the young orangutans to be really afraid of even a rubber fake. And it seems that even one lesson in fear is usually enough. While I was searching for information about snakes and primates, I discovered that natural selection has given humans the ability to quickly spot danger without even knowing. The image of a snake triggers specific neural responses in the brain of a 7- to 10-month-old infant. That is, even people who have no idea that snakes are treated more carefully than any other animal or insect. Well, that's probably how we survived. But okay, the ability to notice snakes seems pretty logical from an evolutionary point of view. But what about morality? Many people think that people do good things and don't do bad things just because the latter is forbidden by law. But here's a fact, primates also have an understanding of right and wrong. For example, they respect property rights and expect to be treated according to their place in the hierarchy. Chimpanzees intervene in fights to stop them, and bonobos tend to behave in their own moral way, taking care of each other and preserving harmony. Do you see where I'm going with this? If animals have a fully human understanding of morality, it means that it wasn't created by humans. Apparently, it came about evolutionarily when our very distant ancestors started living in small groups. <laughs> Except that animals' ideas about morality, shall we say, aren't the same for all species, while primates reason almost human like birds. Look for yourself. Here's a nest of herons with three chicks in it. There were three chicks until two of them started attacking the third one, and they didn't rest until it was doomed to death. Here's another example in the exact same story. The struggle for survival here is constant, and there are no kinship feelings. The fewer chicks in the nest, the more food everyone gets. More food means more chances to grow and continue the line terribly simple logic. And by the way, mothers remain indifferent in such situations. Morality? What morality? Let the children kill each other. But do you know why the mother doesn't care? It's just that a few years ago she killed her brothers or sisters in order to survive. We'll see you later.